And we're going to talk about power today. The uh, Bible talks about different types of power. In fact, <clears throat> if you, I don't know if you ever study on the subject of a power, but the Bible basically talks about seven, seven different types of a power. All right? I don't have time to mention all that and study all that, but that's the time for uh, subject for another day. Uh, but um, you know, I mean, we're going to talk about one of them today. You know, there's a power of wisdom, power of knowledge, and power of authority, and so forth and so on. But today, we're going to talk about the power that is pertaining to every Christian. Okay, I I notice a lot of people likes to exercise their power within their hands. Um, sometimes they overdo it. Um, which results in dissension and um, uh, complain and all the kind of negative feelings. But today we have a powerful passage in Matt, the book of Philippians, chapter 3, where, in starting with verse 10, and right off the bat, Paul talks about this power here in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Okay, what is this power? Uh, in Greek, it's dunamis, and that's the word that you are most familiar with, dunamis. And, you know, when, when the Bible talks about dunamis, it basically uh, is pertaining to the ability to do something. Uh, that's dunamis. And um, in other parts of the Bible also talks about this power. Um, I'm especially thinking of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, uh, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we, um, all that we, What's the word? Imagine or think, even think. Uh, according to, according to the power that works in us. The same word, the power dunamis, uh, is being employed there, and Paul is basically talking about the same thing over there as well as here. So what is this uh, uh, resurrection power? And how do we obtain it? And how is it different from other types of power that the Bible talks about? So um, first, there is that power, dunamis, of resurrection. Um, and the, uh, there's uh, some uniqueness about this power that is different from all the other types of power here. So as you read the gospel accounts, I think it is rather clear that resurrection power is the kind that works when all hope, all hope otherwise is gone. Wasn't that true at the grave site of Jesus Christ? All the hopes of the disciples had collapsed. The sun was blotted out of the sky, and, and there was nothing left to them. And with hopeless, dreary abandon, they went back. They began going back to old ways of life, such as fishing. And then the resurrection comes. And out of that despair and death, out of, the, out of that hopelessness that came, the shining light of the resurrection that changed everything, transformed everything. And, and that is resurrection power. You see, you see it, we see it at the uh, uh, 
grave of Lazarus. Behold, Martha says in her blunt way, he stinks, it stinks. That's about as hopeless as you can get, isn't it? But the resurrection power said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth. That resurrection power within us is the power that turns defeat into success. He turns failure into victory and sorrow into joy and despair into hope. So that's the kind of, kind of dunamis we're talking about this morning. And we rarely associate this power with knowing. But here in verse 10, that is being associated with the knowing Christ. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. I'd like to turn to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9 talks about the worth and the value of knowing God here. And verse 9, um, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, thus says the Lord, verse 23, thus says the Lord. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising love, kindness, judgment, and righteousness, righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So God in the Old Testament tells the people that if they want to be happy or proud of something, then get to know the Lord. And knowing God results in the delight of God. And we know this in John 17, 3, um, that the eternal life, we have the, the eternal life is knowing Christ. It's all about knowing Christ, that we have that eternal life. And the Bible is uh, so clearly uh, mentioned that. And in Philippians chapter 3, is simply, uh, simply echoing something that the Bible has been saying all along. So, if you begin to learn this, um, Paul, what Paul says here implies an experience because he says that I may know him, knowing Christ. Now, it's not talking about superficial knowledge about Christ. Um, the, the word uh, knowing, being knowing right here, knowing him, it's, uh, it's talking about knowing Christ in such much deeper level. So much so that you have a deeper relationship. We have, you have developed deeper relationship with Christ, rooted and grounded in his love. So uh, when we get to learn about this uh, power of the resurrection. You get to know Christ in a much deeper level. You see, according to the passage here, you cannot, let me say that again, um, we can only know the same resurrection power if we have experienced the uh, same kind of death of Christ. In other words, you cannot know resurrection power if you are still alive. If you are still alive, you will never know what this means. 
So we struggle. Sometimes we struggle between the life God has given, new life God has given us, and the life we used to live. And there is a struggle in between. So Paul says in Corinthians that the, um, our outward man struggles and perish, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. We experience that as Christians because uh, we are living in a sinful world and we have sinful nature. There was a man by the name, name of John Jasper at the turn of um, uh, 19th century. He was uh, born as a PK, but he was, he was a prodigal son. And the mother always prayed for John. But he was always reluctant to accept Christ. And in fact, uh, he went the other way. He went all the way to the other ways. And uh, it brought so much pain and suffering into lives of the parents. But one day, John was sitting on the bench in the local park. And God came down and struck him and he became crippled right there. The struggle began. Struggle began. For the next six weeks, he struggled until he finally decided to give his life to Christ. And um, if you know, if you study the history, you're going to come across his, to his name, um, Christian history. One day, he had a dream, all right? I love to talk about dream. <laughs> he had a dream. Um, and in the dream, he was wound up into, uh, at the gate of heaven, at the pearly gate of heaven. But he was being stopped by, the, by an angel by the gate, a guardian angel, um, guarding angels. Um, and uh, John says, sir, I'd like to get in. What's your name? John Jasper. So the angel uh, opens up the book and look for John. And he reads and, he, and, the, and, and says, sorry, you cannot get in here. Why not? Well, the angel began to uh, tell him what he did wrong. Many pages long. Um, and then I still want to get in. I would like to talk to your boss. Well, you can't do that. Well, I really need to talk to your boss. Uh, isn't he? Oh, I see him coming. There was a Jesus coming from uh, the other direction towards the gate, pearly gate of heaven. And, 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 and John goes, Jesus, Jesus, it's me, John. And Jesus came running and gave him a big hug. And John Jasper, out of sheer joy, he rejoiced and, and he turned toward the angels and winked at him and said, you see, when you know the boss, you can get in. <laughs> you know what our problem is as Christians? Sometimes we forget who our boss is. Sometimes we forget who's in control. Because we are living in this sinful world when we faced with the problems of life, when we have uh, uh, problems with the finance or marital problems or, or drug problem with the drugs and, and abuses and, uh, and the, uh, all kinds of problems that we face with the conflicts. We sometimes forget who the boss is here. And it will be well for us to remember at, in those moments who the boss is. You see, the resurrection power is working in us. And if we experience it as the 
effects of being born again, and we also experience in the sufferings that we face. Therefore, you do not lose heart, Paul says. He admonishes. You do not lose heart. Even though your outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Remember, the walk we have chosen in this pathway is a daily walk with Jesus. That brings to uh, the next, another important point, and, and it is the daily struggle that we face each day. We need to be recharged and renewed each and every day of our lives. And we forget that time sometimes. We forget. There's imp the importance of getting renewed day by day is being mentioned here, um, indirectly here. The second thing that stems from this knowledge of Christ is the fellowship of his suffering. Look at that verse again. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. What is fellowship of his suffering? You know, this remarkable thing about the suffering of Christ is that it's usually for someone else. Jesus suffered not so much for himself, but for everyone else around him, for the entire mankind. And this calls for compassion. Now, this is not something that you obtain because you, you are trying so hard. No. You will never obtain this kind of a compassion, this kind of uh, power of resurrection just because you are trying, just because you are striving to gain something. You will never get that. It is resurrection power is the byproduct of knowing Christ. It happens and it flows naturally as you get to know Christ in intimate detail. It will never come to you. It will never come to me. I will never obtain that power just because I'm trying so hard. No matter how hard you are striving, no matter how hard you are struggling, we never get that. Because we are talking about divine power here. And Paul says, it's the fellowship of his suffering. Did you know God is suffering today? How do you know? God is God, but how, can, how come God can suffer? Exactly. That's a fairly a common sense, isn't it? When your children suffer, the parents do suffer. And my Bible says, love suffers along. Love suffers long. In love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love suffers long. That's why I know God is suffering today because of so much sin problems here on earth. So you who love, know that love always suffers. And parents know that very well. Knowing Christ will inevitably involve us in what he is doing, which is suffering here. That is the part of the, that is the, part of the fellowship of his suffering. And then it's, Paul goes on to say in the same verse that the fellowship of his suffering being conformed 
to his death. Becoming like him in death, in other translation. We become like him in death. What does that mean? You see, Jesus paid a penalty for our sins on the cross of Calvary. Wage of sin is death. Although he was sinless, he became sin bearer for us. And he, he, he paid the penalty of all the uh, sins of the mankind. So um, to be made conform unto his death simply means to accept that judgment and to refuse to let these dead things live any longer in our experience. And that reminds me of Romans, Romans chapter 6, I believe Romans chapter 6, where it says, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, let me actually go there and look at that verse because I cannot recall it at the moment here. Romans chapter 6, um, I'm thinking of verse uh, 11 here, starting with verse 10, actually. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Reckon yourself to, consider yourself to be dead in sin. Don't forget that, he says. Don't forget that you're dead to sin in Christ. Um, but alive to God. Alive with God in Christ. So, um, we have a tendency to forget that we are dead to self. That we are liberated from sin. That we are purified from sin. So being made conf conformable unto his death simply means accept the judgment of God upon all the sinners and to refuse to let these things pertaining to death live any longer in our own personal experience. Because we have been delivered from death. We're no longer constantly concerned about what happens to us, but with, we are concerned about what happens to Christ and what happens to our loved ones around us. And what a ministry that is. That power of resurrection is constantly changing every situation from hopelessness to hope, from sorrow into joy, Compassion that endures patiently and that purity which sets free from all the inner compulsion of selfish living and makes us the instrument of His grace and His peace. And we have that access to power of resurrection. I must stress once again, this is not achieved by trying, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you struggle or strive, we will never get that. It comes as a byproduct of knowing Christ. That's why the apostle says, God is faithful who has called you into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. But as I mentioned, people do forget about this, that their old self was done away with. And Paul, in fact, had to deal with that problem because Christians did forget. And especially, I'm thinking of in, in the Corinthians, in Corinthian church, 
had all kinds of problems, a schism and division among a strife, stri strife among the members and the, um, the gossip and uh, all kinds of problems arose within Corinthian church. And so Paul had to deal with the problems. So he, he spent considerable pages to the church, with the church of Corinthians to deal with these all kinds of problems. That's because they forgot who the boss is. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. It's interesting to note how Paul's personal journey pan out. Have you noticed Paul becomes more humble and humble as years advance? In the uh, Ephesian, Paul mentions that he is the least of all the saints. He, he identifies himself as the one who is least among all the brothers and sisters. That's uh, humility. That's being humble, isn't it? And he assesses himself uh, much lower than other apostles. In other place, in 1 Corinthians, uh, verse, chapter 15, verse 9, he says, I'm the least, least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called apostles. And in Corinthians, in, in his letter to Corinthians, he says, I am the chief of the sinners. See, as, as time advances, he is becoming mature and he is becoming more humble. He's becoming more humble. Like Jesus, humble himself even to the death of the cross. So how was Paul transformed? How did he become defender, most able defender of the gospel, gospel messages from a persecutor of the saints? Well, uh, this uh, pen of inspiration, Steps to Christ, Steps to Christ, page 70. This well describes how transformation took place. A life in Christ is a life of restfulness. There may be no ecstasy of a feeling, but there should be an abiding, peaceful trust. Your hope is not in yourself. It is in Christ. Your weakness is united to his strength. Your ignorance to his wisdom your frailty to his enduring might. So you are not to look to yourself, not, not to let the mind dwell upon self, but look to Christ. Let the mind dwell upon his love, upon the beauty, the perfection of his character. Christ in his self-denial, Christ in his humiliation, Christ in his purity and holiness, Christ in his matchless love. This is the subject for the soul's contemplation. It is by loving him, copying him, depending wholly upon him, that you are able to be transformed into his likeness. It is by looking upon Jesus that we become transformed. It is by knowing him that we get to have that power of resurrection. Paul goes on to say in verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's pressing toward. In spite of all the negative circumstances he was under, now he is writing, he was writing in prison. He says, I'm pressing forward. And what's the goal? Goal here is Christ's 
likeness. Christ likeness. And that is ongoing process and progress we need to make. Life of Christian is not about perfection, but a progress. But I, every once in a while, I come across a perfectionist who will drive you nuts. Those who are laughing, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I once heard a uh, definition of a perfectionist. Uh, and uh, perfectionist is uh, someone who takes pain and gives it to others. <laughs> and I said, that's about right. <laughs> but see, but, but I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to tell you, um, when we talk about Christ-likeness, which is our goal, um, we will, you will never become just like a Christ, but the goal is become, becoming more like a Christ. We're talking about progress, pilgrims' progress here. As long as we are making progress, although you are, you are far from being, being perfect, you are fine. Okay, you are fine. You are, although you are far from being perfect, that's who I am. I'm far from being perfect. But I hope I'm trying to make a progress every day. As long as you are doing that, as long as this church, Shingle Springs Church, is making uh, progress toward Christ-likeness, we are fine. We are doing fine. In the eyes of Christ, we are being perfect. And how do we obtain that uh, resurrection power? I'm going to close with this idea here. Okay, uh, you can forget about everything I said. Don't forget about what I'm, what I'm about to say. Um, how do we obtain that power of resurrection? That is being actually mentioned in verse 8 and 9. Um, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. You indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, in order to get to know him, in order to have a power of resurrection. I'm doing this, Paul says, verse 9. What is he, what is he, what is he doing? I'm trying to uh, get that righteousness of Christ. How? By faith in Christ. This is a very simple gospel message. How do we get the power of resurrection? By believing, by having all the belief, teachings of Jesus Christ and internalize it into my daily living. And, and, and by believing Christ, the righteousness of Christ is being put upon me and put upon you. And you begin the journey of getting to know Christ, your relationship between God and man begins there, and that's how you have access to the power of resurrection. Problem with us, we forget who the boss is. We forget who, is, who really is in charge of everything that happens around us. Flannery O'Connor. An American writer once said, Where there is no belief in the soul, there is very little drama. Either one is serious about salvation or one is not. And it is well to realize that the maximum amount of seriousness admits the maximum amount of comedy. Only if we are secure in our beliefs can we see the comical side of the universe. 
only when we are secure in our beliefs in Christ. Can we see the comical side of the universe? When you look around the world today, what do you see? We hear about wars. We hear about, hear about the endless turmoil in the Middle East. And we hear about uh, the uh, wildfires and uh, hurricanes. And uh, we hear about all kinds of negative things. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was visiting with one of the uh, members from um, Forest Hill Church company. And uh, she, um, all the church members in Forest Hill had to evacuate. You, you're still, that memory is still fresh in our mind. And many of you, some of you, had to evacuate. So I went to visit this lady who fled from the wildfire, and um, and she said, as she said, she had a moment of notice as the um, ashes of a smoke was was covering the ground uh, around her house, and she had a moment of notice, and she fled. And and as she was, she was fleeing, she said, "I didn't care about my home." If my, gets, my home gets burnt, that's God's business, she said. And then she had a little, little smile on her face as she was uh, telling me all that. And I think that's what this person is talking about. Only if we are secure in our beliefs can we see the comical side of the universe. And Paul is telling us the secret of being happy here about how we can be joyful and be happy and be being content in this world full of negative news and um, the sinful things that are happening around us. How can we still be happy? You know, when you are secure in the arms of Jesus, it doesn't matter what happens to you, to your house, or to your even family members, if you are secure with your beliefs, the teachings of Jesus, you have nothing to be afraid of. You can face the future unafraid because in the eyes of Christ, we are immortal. The death cannot take us away from Christ. Nothing in, no power in the universe will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, as Paul says. Nothing, no power, no nothing in this world and the world to come, nothing will ever be able to take us away from love of God. So in a nutshell, faith in Christ gives us his righteousness that involves confession of our sins, uh, born again experience, and faith, and all that. And that faith in Christ inevitably will cause us to be united with the life of Christ, union with Christ. Faith in Christ, union with Christ resulting in power of resurrection. That's how simple that is. You see, we, we have a simple message to preach to the world. If we are in union with Christ, we suffer with Christ, just as Christ is suffering with his children today. His interest is our interest. And as long as Christ lives within us, we'll never forget that we have access to that power of resurrection today. May God help us that we will never forget that we as Christians have that tremendous dunamis 
in Christ. We are invincible in the eyes of God. May God help us and bless us in this. Amen.